This is the strategy inside everything. I'm Adam Pirino. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Strategy Inside Everything. Uh, today we are going to have an enlightening conversation. I'm positive. Um, our guest today is Nick Childs. He is co-founder of um, Dirt Research Technologies, and I know Nick from Twitter, where I, a lot of my guests are found. Learning about Dirt, I, I had to talk to him. I wanted to see what they're what they're working on there and what they're creating, so, because this is an area that I'm really interested in. Nick, thank you so much for making time to join. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Adam. It's a pleasure. Your background is not, you're not, when I think of a, a tech startup or a research startup, you're not the typical background that I would think because you, you have a legacy of award-winning creative work. Can you, um, I mean, you've been everywhere pretty much. So <laughs> can you give people a sense of your background and career before we talk about Dirt? I, I, I feel like I can, and I can't give a sense of background and career. I can tell you the background. I, I'm yeah. not sure I can make much sense of the career. <laughs> um but there's this great book that I mention all the time called Range by David Epstein that I, I love to send to people and I love to talk about. And I think talking about his thesis in that wonderful book feels feels like I get credit for having written it because I think it's got a brilliant insight, which is that I've had a very diverse career and I love that he wrote about the idea that having a career that ranges across unexpected jobs, unexpected opportunities ends up in the long haul for certain kinds of people being very, very beneficial because you learn to put unexpected pieces together. And as a creative person and somebody who is driven to the creative fields my whole life, writing, filmmaking, TV, um, advertising, even, uh, I, I love the idea that you don't need to be creative by making things out of whole cloth. You need to try and be creative by putting unexpected pieces together. And that's mm -hmm. kind of a cliche and nothing tremendously new, but I think is, is spot on. And, and my career has jumped around a bit. And your introduction is funny because I feel like even before dirt and getting into the research field, no matter where I would talk to anybody about any job, they would start with that question or, 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 statement you've been a lot of places you've yeah, done yeah. A lot of I, different I, you know things. i just did an episode uh, with someone else who has has been a lot of places and played a lot of different parts mm -hmm. and it's i don't mean it as an as an insult in any way it's but yeah. it is factual that you've you've seen the creative industry from a lot of different perspectives and, yes. and you know approach it a lot of different ways yeah and one part of that the the positive narrative story that I put behind that is by seeing it in various different ways, you're able to put those pieces together and do something unique and interesting. The tricky part is convincing others that that's the smart path and then therefore the role you should be in next. So I jumped over to DIRT, which is a, a biometric neuroscientific research company. And, and we can talk about what exactly that means in a little bit, but it's still driven by the hope to make the work that people do, the creative at the at the core of anything. Um, if that's games, mobile games, um, mobile platforms, film, television, any content that people are making, fundamentally make that content better from the creative perspective. And, and that's my role coming into what is more of a technology, software, research company, at the core of what we do, at the heart of what we do at DIRT is to drive that success of the creative itself forward. So having somebody like me in a position at the company became very, very important for the CEO who founded the company. He, he, saw, he saw how my role made sense before I did. Yeah, well, I could see why you're, you've are you been on the other side of the table when someone says, okay, yes. I think we want to test this. And that that cold sweat that I've gotten before when I heard those <laughs> words as a, as a creative, where you go, oh, no, they're going to, you inevitably think they're going to water it down instead of improve it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. What, as a, you've been a CD, an ECD, a CCO, I mean, you've, you've worked in, in all the, the big holding companies. What was your experience? Tell me about your experience with testing and what it was like, you know, cause you you've been there before technology was really possible to do what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about your experience with 
testing your own creative or testing the creative of your teams? My experience was, I would say in the early years was really paying attention to the focus group testing um, for bigger campaigns and bigger spots. Quite honestly, we didn't get a lot of feedback in those areas and certainly not a lot of targeted feedback that seemed beneficial to the makers, the creative people. That's funny. You said we didn't get a lot of feedback. What you meant was we didn't get any valuable feedback. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, to be honest too, I feel like we weren't invited to a ton of meetings to even get that feedback. I feel like it was a process for the, for the, for the strategy teams and, if a meeting got missed, you didn't really get it. And maybe it got sent to through to you and you were supposed to read it, but you didn't really. And by the time we got a lot of it, it felt like it was impacting what we'd already created more than further upstream and what we might make that could hit the audiences better. So it was much more targeted to versioning and edits and things like that. Or if something was coming through that simply wasn't working through an audience, how could you fix it? And being a filmmaker uh, and a producer at, at my at the heart of things from the beginning of my career, I, I kind of appreciated that and knew it and, and was able to use that feedback and, and know how to re-edit and do all of those things. But I was more interested, I think, than and this may be unfair to say, but then most creatives in the strategy of things, in trying to understand what was driving audience behavior at the very beginning of creating any idea. So I feel like from the early days of getting into large holding company, creative agencies, like when I joined Gray, I feel as if I I was one of the creatives asking for more and more and more strategic insight and not getting it all the time so that we would almost bake our strategy and insight out of the idea we would come up with. We would try to come up with what we thought was a really interesting idea, have some kind of eye on why that would be intriguing to an audience. And then as we were getting ready to pitch it or make it kind of back out into, oh, here is why that makes sense. Yeah, you were, you'd you kind of reverse way. engineer a, a secondary insight yeah. that would be like, well, this is the this is not the insight in the brief, but this is the insight that this idea is baked in. Yeah, that's that's exactly. a, a exactly. smart a smart way to pin it to something bigger than your punchline or to the to the story that you're telling on its own. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I've jumped around between creative agencies, communications agencies. Uh, at Fleischmann Hillard and then moving over to the media side of things. So I've kind of seen that quote unquote brief from different perspectives. And over the years, that's made me more and more strategic. I I think I've always been a very strategic, creative person. I've always been um, somebody who aspired to writing or filmmaking with the audience in mind. I met Michael Moore, the great documentarian once um, because I had a project at um, kind of a film uh, festival and event and got a chance to talk to him and his basic, just as I remember it, as I like to remember, it was like looking at me and saying, Hey, look, if you make movies for your friends on the Lower East Side, that's totally cool. But if you want to put butts in, se- in seats in theaters and a lot of them, then you better understand what the audience wants to see and make it for them. And that's always been my take creatively was if you're being the kind of artist who wants to work in their loft or in their garage or wherever and paint for 30 years and then have somebody discover those paintings later in your life or after you're gone and say, oh my God, this is this some amazing undiscovered artist. That's fine. But just understand what you're doing. If you're making anything that has an audience at the end that in the moment you want to sell to, and by sell, I mean, engage, yeah. um, interest, then I, I don't really understand the creative perspective of being precious and saying, I don't want that input. I, I, I need to do my own intuition and follow that. And that's all that matters. There's a nice, healthy balance between trusting and testing your intuition. But, um, but I think having those really strategic insights is only valuable to makers. Yeah. And you could, that's so funny that you say that you could be satisfied doing either thing. You could be satisfied just painting for your own, the enjoyment of yes. of putting the paint on the canvas for yourself and painting over it two days later. Yes. Nothing, and I think wrong one of, nothing wrong with it. And part of what's interesting now and what I'm doing deeply at DIRT and in the research side is understanding, I, I'm feeling it's better to 
it's always more helpful to get those insights and do that research earlier up the funnel, as we say, or earlier in the process. Because I do also believe once you've made the thing and you've put it out into the audience, other than tweaking it as you might need to for whatever marketing reasons, that's the point at which you want to stop listening to people. You know, hearing audience feedback after you've made something and burying your head because you're miserable because they did or didn't like it is really, really tricky. I'm trying to get better at don't listen at that point, move on to the next thing, make the next thing better, make the next thing work harder. Yeah, that is always a hard part of testing because because you can test like a, an animatic or you can test a storyboards, but those are always incomplete. And so what do you what you get back may not be really reflective of what the what the intent of the piece was. Yes. Or you could test a cut, but you it's very unlikely that you have something in the can that you can go mm -hmm. fix it with. If they say, "Well, yeah, I like it, but I don't like that casting." You know, who? Why is that guy the dad? That doesn't make any sense. He's too young. And then yeah, go, now I'm and stuck. What do I do? I learned this long time ago when I was working at HBO and we were showing cuts of films to audiences and the audience by audiences, I mean, people who were pulled in off the street and became a focus group to watch a movie in a screening room at HBO. And I remember one day I was working with the director and he was upset with some of the feedback um, that we were getting from the focus group. And I, and I said, Okay, but with a grain of salt, the person who said that about that character in a very dramatic moment is is literally, I saw them pull him off the street as a pizza delivery person. Nothing against being a pizza delivery person, but it is one person's opinion. I wouldn't re-edit the whole film around that. And I'm not saying that that director was planning to, but I do see the danger in um, being a, too allegiant to that feedback. And part of what's interesting to me and what we're doing on the neuroscientific end of measuring emotions and measuring what people don't tell us, but actually happens in their head as they're watching something is to say there's value in the other side of the testing too. There's value in hearing what people think they saw and how they think they reacted and what they're telling you reacted because that tends to lean toward what they will remember and tell other people down the line. What we do on the neuroscientific end with specific biometric devices is to measure what their brain is actually seeing in the moment. And so those, I think those two things, one isn't necessarily better. I'll just be open and be kind and say that, uh, but inarguably they work together really, really well. And being able to capture that in the moment response at least gives you another measure against the filters that people put up where they, maybe they think they're supposed to react a certain way. So they tell you either what they think you want to hear, or they play to their own persona and they say, Oh no, I would never, I would never like that because it's not who I, you know, it doesn't represent who I am. But meanwhile, you're watching a, you know, fMRI and you're watching it light up like, Oh no, she, this guy loves Nicole Kidman. There's no problem. <laughs> Yes. And I can go into that. It's what we're measuring too doesn't necessarily tell you loves. It tells okay. you is is interested in that moment, is paying attention. And what we do is so dirt itself, the word dirt like earth. Um, the idea behind it is that we love to, we hope to partner with clients and creators and really dig deep into their challenges and kind of play in a sandbox with them, right? That's the fun and cute description of why we came up with the name, but it's also an acronym for discover and illuminate real truth. Mm. Um, and so we've built a, a tech enabled insights company that uses neuroscientific principles to measure emotion in audiences specifically to help creators make their work connect more powerfully with people, with those audiences. And the reason we created Dirt, and this is really my partners, uh, Ryan Anthony, who's the CEO, and Brendan Murray, who's our chief science officer, have been doing this for years and years and years, and the tech side of it successfully, is because clients have a lot of ways to measure consumer behavior right? The A-B testing, the survey testing, the focus groups. And we think, we know we can be invaluable if we identify what drives those behaviors. So you can measure behavior on the one side, and we can understand by using what we do, what drives that behavior on a biological level, level right? 
<clears throat> that's a complicated way to explain it. So there's actually like a really easy way to, um, we measure people's attention and engagement by bringing them into a lab. We put sensors on them, like a little sensor on their wrist, it looks like an Apple iWatch, and we attach two nodules that goes up to their fingers, and we measure their response in the moment, how they're re responding physiologically to any type of content that we put in front of them. And that can be mobile and platform games, UX and UI. It could be ads and movie trailers. It can be anything, right? Uh, yeah, and you, you just described the missing link there because there are um... – you know, there has been A-B testing, there has been in quantitative testing, even where we're, we're able to say they prefer this over that. You mm -hmm. can add open ends, you can add highlighting exercises, you can add forced choice to get them to ex give you a reason why, but you never really know why they prefer one over another, unless it's unanimously like, I like, we all like this one because of this singular reason. Exactly, exactly. And there's value in seeing with the group, hey, who likes this one over that one? But no matter what, if you can couple that with the readings we're getting from their brain, we can show you, was that really real, right? So if you're doing a skin of a character in a video game that you may want people to download and buy, they might tell you they like that character, that skin, that storyline, and their brains might all be pointing to something else. And what that does, Adam, is it gives you an opportunity to go back to the makers and say, here's what they're saying. So there may be some value of that, of telling people, but maybe they're being biased. And maybe what they really like is this one. How about we go back to work on that one and make it more interesting for the audience? And what we've seen is when we then do retesting, suddenly the one that they thought they weren't interested in when they talk to you but their brain was interested in, you make some tweaks to the one that their brain was interested in. And now they're saying, that's the one I was most interested in, and our brains are telling you it's the are, one we're most yeah, interested in. Yeah, in that example, are you able to see, let's say you showed them you know, five character skins. Mm -hmm. Are you able to see commonality? Are you able to get to that level to say like, oh, I see what, like here's the common element of what they are reacting to through, through the... The yes, yes. Um, and without getting too deep in the weeds, what we use is something called galvanic skin response primarily. And that's the this nodule that, that you know, like what I watch attaches around your wrist and goes up to two um, stickies with sensors that attach yeah. to your fingers. And it measures the infinitesimal change in um, sweat secretion, basically. I'm doing a terrible job and our science officer, Brendan. No, I, I, this is, this, you're doing a good job. <laughs> but um, what that does is you then track that to a timeline of the content that you're putting in front of them and you have a trace that looks like um looks like a mountain graph on top of the content kind of Got and it. we deliver that back to the clients and show them here's where people were paying more attention and less attention and Got the it. attention forms memories and to explain it simply because this is how I understand it. It's the formation of memories that matter, right? It's the attention that matters, not necessarily good or bad attention. Although we can extract and consult on whether or not that was good or bad attention, because we know what the content was at that moment. So if the GR, uh, GSR spikes at that moment, and we know it was a moment of um, action, then we can say it was a moment of action when it spiked and they were interested in action. So there's a way to, uh, to correlate a specific emotion with it. But really what it's doing is taking a moment of attention and saying, unlike the other kind of testing where they're going to tell you what they might suggest to somebody in the future, this is forming a memory. And when you form memories, it's part of the flight or uh, fight response you're forming an action that you're more likely to take in the future, right? Something you're more likely to also respond to in the future. And what that allows us to do is to go back to makers and not be, as the way I like to put it, the emperor who's doing a thumbs up or thumbs down on yeah. your work and saying, this is good or bad. It allows us to come back to you and say, here's where the audience is interested. We consult on, here's why they're interested. Here's how to make them more interested. Don't you want to go back to your work and make those parts that you've already put in there because you like them work better? And the parts that aren't working so well, maybe those are the parts that we drop or don't pay as much attention to, but it gives the playing field back to the creators. And I'm not being like flip here or a Pollyanna and saying like, oh, and it helps creators too. I'm literally saying when I've been in meetings now with 
chief creative officers and clients and board members and CEOs and heads of marketing and researchers and strategists, all of them tend to come back after seeing even a very first test and go, holy shit, this helps us align around where we want to go next. Like it yeah. literally, it, it makes them, nobody has come back and maybe this will happen and that'll be fun and we'll see how it goes. Maybe somebody will come back and be like, oh, I don't like this at all. But they don't tend to go there. They tend to start focusing on the opportunities that the data and the research presents to them. Is that part of your role is to, I'm sure is to translate this, this new thing that a lot of people have not yet experienced as a, as a client to see understanding what the results mean uh, to a creative person, but is part of your role also to help guide them to say, look, this is an area that is really capturing their attention. Here are some ideas for you, or do you stay out of that part and just kind of get them to understand and, and how it might play out in the future, like an area of focus, but not giving them potential ideas? That's a great question. I think it, it, it can wonderfully quickly get to, well, what should we do? We are living in the mm -hmm. area of we're building the technology, we're building the software, we're doing multiple different things to completely change hopefully and revolutionize how this research is doing, pulling it out of labs, making it much faster, making it much more applicable to other teams that need it, making it much clearer. I There's part of me always as a, as a ex creative officer. And yeah, a your brain and just go, your brain goes like, to oh, solutions. Do this. Sure. Yeah. But we're going to live in the space. And I kind of hope forever of if it gets to a point where the client's saying, well, would, what would you recommend we do instead? Or what might be a great pursuit in this campaign? Recommending um, all of the wonderful people we know and can link in from um, an agency perspective yeah, or stay, uh, stay objective. production company. Yeah, and also bring in people who are talented and amazing and hardworking at what they do, right? There's no more, it sounds, I don't know, maybe it sounds disingenuous, but like there's no more pleasure for me at my age and point in my career now than understanding it's not my job to do all of these things. And that while I wanted to be a great writer or a director or a showrunner on TV, like now what is my role? My role, I feel, fits back to what we just began with of rage. What are the pieces that I can help put together to make something great and yeah. fun and work with as a team toward a solution? And it's much more valuable for us to come in and say, oh, you want to talk to uh, a strategist who knows what's coming next in the world of fandoms? Well, that's Zoe Scamone. Let's yeah. call Zoe and bring her in. Yeah. You want to walk, talk to a creative agency? Let's call up Nils and his team at Uncommon. You know, I just think there's so many opportunities to go to wonderfully talented, incredibly hardworking, far more brilliant people and say, can we include you in on this? And look, my hope, and hopefully it's not naive, is by doing that, we create a playing field in which everybody's coming to solve the problem, as opposed to what I experienced so many times in the traditional marketing space, or certainly holding company is, you need to bring solutions that are all underneath the same umbrella, or yes. everybody's fighting for pieces of the pie. And so it becomes challenging early on to do the work and jockey the politics of the situation. So we're 100%. trying to avoid the latter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't want to create a situation where you're bringing in salespeople to sell their, their vertical product. And it's always exactly. the answer, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where dirt can plug in. By dirt, I mean anybody in this kind of field. If you come in and you're not white labeled by a big agency group, um, I think we could be a solution direct to their clients and really, really be helpful. It may be easier to go straight to the clients, but I think there'll be a lot of different ways to come to the table selfishly from my perspective and our company's perspective um, that could be beneficial as long as we understand everybody's roles. One of the ways I like to say it, and, and I'm not sure if this is the best way to say it is, when we partner with other people and go to the table for a client, what's nice about playing those different roles clearly too is 
if they do work with us and find no value in it, they can stop working with us, but keep their creative agency. If they're finding value by being brought to the table by a media agency in what we do at Dirt, and then they shift from that media agency, they could still use us from Dirt. And I think that's really important um, yeah, that we be honest about in the in the modern landscape is people are going to jump around all the time for different reasons. So you kind of need to understand and be able to measure your specific success. I have a question about the, I know you're not a statistician or a data scientist, but when you are like, what's a sample for something like this? Let's, you mentioned that you can mm. test um, UX, for example, how many people do you, would you typically include or what, what have you tested so far that like, what's a reasonable sample? I'm assuming it's more than a focus group, but less than a real quant sample. Yes. So another awesome question right now, the way we do these neuroscientific tests, I, I mentioned uh, GSR, galvanic skin response, which requires the sensor to be put on people. And we also implement um, and incorporate eye tracking in a bunch of these studies, because that's a valuable addition to where they were paying attention. To do that, that's primarily done on laptops now. We do that in lab, and by in lab, we have a partnership with a team out west and has multiple locations around the globe that allows us to open up those labs even during the pandemic, we've been able to do it. Um, and certainly that'll be easier as, as restrictions lift, but it's challenging, right? You have to bring people into a lab, you have to get them to come. And even if it takes a couple hours of their day to get yeah. there, it kills a day for them and you have to compensate them in a certain way. And it takes a lot of time. We generally do, I would say 60 to a hundred plus people in those tests. And they take a few days to, to get three, four or five people at a time through the um, content. And then we were able to give back absolutely 100% solid data from that size group. We are building a solution that breaks that um, process completely and we'll be able to make it easier for people to do this outside of a lab setting and could scale anywhere we want beyond that to hundreds yeah, to thousands of people. That's interesting. Are you doing them in primarily in New York or have so far, have you traveled and taken it to other markets so that you could get a more diverse group of respondents? We have been doing it in San Francisco and okay. in Los Angeles, because that's where the company that we are partnered with who does um, can gather these groups is based right now and has their offices, their, their locations back open. They have um, locations around the world. So as soon as there's a need for it, and we are working with some global clients, particularly in the gaming space and mobile gaming space now who are, um, who are everywhere. And so I think very quickly in the next year or so, we'll get to doing that in locations around the world, London, Singapore, Japan, wherever else we need to go. Uh, our, again, our Brendan, our science officer, would speak to this better, but I think it totally depends on the content you're putting in front of people and yeah. the kind of demographic you want. I, generally, for what we're doing, we do focus on the demographic for very specific ways. Are they gamers? Do they play these kinds of games? Things like that. But it doesn't matter whether or not we're doing that in New York City as opposed to L.A. That's just you know whether or not we can find those people in those locations. Yeah, I mean, if you can get it out of the lab and get it to that scale, then it won't matter at all. You can you can go right. cross cross any country and get you know purely demographic or psychographic match. Yes, absolutely. That's fantastic. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I mean, the promise of it is really interesting, Adam, because we all have these stats that kind of speak to the story we want to tell. But when I started digging into this with the team, um, you know, these numbers of uh, kind of failure are astronomical, right? Like 99.5% of mobile ads don't convert. Um, and that's before a new iOS and 96 of people opting out, opting out of tracking completely. And like, yeah. 80% of products fail after focus groups. That's after you've gotten people to tell you what they want. They still fail. And even in a somewhat disassociated realm like film and TV, which has tons of money being spent in development and people really care about, nurture and craft these films, 80% of them fail. Yeah, right? they, just, they just disappear. Yeah. And 80% of CEOs in this new study that I was reading earlier this week, that was, I think, 300 CEOs globally literally were quoted as saying they don't think digital advertising is a reliable source of customers or sales, right? So that just shows us again and again that there's this massive room for improvement 
and how we measure what audiences want and how we can do a better job of delivering that to them. So my I guess sales pitch on this is we don't have to get 100% better. This doesn't have to change the world astronomically overnight. It just has to be a percent, 2%, 3%, 4% better. And what we're seeing from the studies we've done with clients is very quickly, they're seeing it's exponentially more than those small percents. So nice. it's, just a, it's just a lot of fun to approach things from the perspective of it doesn't feel like I'm doing a pitch, a VC pitch, a sales pitch, because maybe for the first time, I, I just want to do the work. Like I want to see, I want to see if it works for people. I want to see and work with the teams that it could change things for. And I want to say, what's your problem? What's the real ROI or whatever you're trying to measure against? Let's talk about that honestly. And if you want to honestly talk about that and we can measure against it let's try our thing and we'll see where it goes our, our thing in lab is look it's an expensive proposition and it takes time so i think you're right doing it now for people who find value in it fantastic doing it once we change the nature of the game and we can do it for a lot more people faster and cheaper that's a whole new world yeah that's a different that's a different endeavor um yeah. question I, because i know you Besides dirt, I know you are a creator. You are participating in and making things uh, all the time. Has this has this understanding changed the way you approach creating? Like, you know, you just made a film. Did you incorporate some of? Maybe you didn't test it, but did you incorporate some of the overall learnings or results that you've seen into how you approach making? Um. What's it, the cobbler's children? <laughs> so I feel like this is I feel like this is the perfect question that you should ask all your guests. Um, you know, the thing you're promising to your clients, do you actually do it inside your agency? Hundred <laughs> um, percent. My answer has always been, oh yeah, we don't really do that part here. Uh, we, I'm fascinated by doing that. Yes, we are doing. We're using absolutely a hundred percent all of the insights, especially the insights that. Ryan, our CEO, Arvind, our chief operating officer, and Brendan, our chief science officer, know from their long backgrounds, right? So there are things that they know that when we look at anything from our own website to the materials we're putting together to the way we talk about things are a better way to present, a better way to build things forward, our platform that we're building, our, our software, all of those things um, for sure. We have not sat down and spent the time and effort to put anything through a test of a hundred people. And I think that's more because there's, you know, our software platform is going to be in beta version in the next month or so. There hasn't been something that's been in a, a, a full enough, even beta um, version to get in front of an audience in a way that we get the right feedback. We're certainly going to do it for ourselves. Um, on the creative side of the kind of projects that I make that hit film festivals and a television show that I'm adapting and, and working on, as soon as those get greenlit, yeah, I'll be offering it to um, that team making that show potentially, or especially in the experiential piece, if there's a way to use what we do when people are going through uh, an experience, that would be amazing. Right now, it's tricky to do that kind of work outside of a lab. And for instance, a lot of the work I do with a guy named Lance Weiler, who's head of the digital storytelling um, area at Columbia University and makes just amazing projects. We've been partnered for years. Those projects put people through an experience and that experience uses digital at its core, whether that's AR, VR, mm -hmm. AI, it's tricky to measure, to put devices on people now, GSR, and measure as they go through an experience or VR, because it's hard to understand what they were looking at. We need everybody to be seeing the same thing so that Got we can it. layer that trace over everybody. But it's fascinating. We're talking to um, a, a global healthcare company right now in the VR space about how to bring this to bear. And that's part of the area we're super excited by, right? There's always the idea that, well, basically, are you trying to make things uh, better that you can put in front of people and have them buy more of it, right? Whether that's a 
audience clicking on watching the next episode on Netflix or having a better experience scrolling through their selections on Apple TV, my feeling and my team's feeling is absolutely 100% what we're doing a lot of the time, but we're fascinated by how we can measure things like implicit bias in policing and mm. um, healthcare and ed tech options and political advertising. Like those things where we might be able to have an impact on the insights we're giving to create work that fundamentally moves audiences to do certain things in areas that we care about. Look, there'll always be part of it that's like, you're going to pick the path that is you care about, but for vaccine adoption, for instance, I, 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 I'm of the opinion that more people should get vaccines. So if we were to connect with a group that were trying to get Americans to adopt the vaccine more, that's the area, kind of area we would love to work deeply with people. Um, give yeah, great the, insights, and, and, move the needle, and have a huge impact. Yeah, and your your testing allows to the identification of uh, root rationale, root thinking yes. beyond just yes or no. It yeah. gets a little bit deeper into why people make the choices they make in the case of yeah. vaccination choices or implicit bias in almost anything, right? Yeah, and Brendan has an amazing um, case study from a couple of years ago, uh, or, or maybe just a year and a half ago, that um, in uh, working with PSAs um, in in attention and, and driving, um, and showing that humor does fundamentally work better than um, lecturing, right? So being able to prove out intuitions that people already have uh, and give them the data. So this kind of com this this simple equation of your intuition plus our data equals better success um, is is great, and it can do that. It can really, at the core of it, help align people around. Okay, that's the path to go. And the way I think about it, I don't know if you agree or if I'm not quite experienced enough on the strategy side, but to me, as a creator, as the maker, as part of the team making whatever PSA, if you came to me and said, hey, we're doing this thing for a distracted driving, right? Um, it should be, as part of the brief was, it needs to be humorous. To me, as a maker, as a writer, as a director, as a producer, like telling me it needs to be humorous is still so open-ended yeah. that that's a great challenge to hit and helps me tremendously. So I'm not trying to chase 15 rabbits. That's the way I've always felt as a creatively driven person was the more you can help focus my attention, the more I'm not <laughs> all over the place and just making shit up out of thin air. Yeah. It's I've often wondered about testing strategies. It's not like you can show someone a creative brief and, or a, or a strategy statement and get a consumer or an end user to respond to it. You're not going to get anything back, mm -hmm. but, but I've wondered if you could find territories and for example, if you were, if you were trying to do something about distracted driving, show them three, you know, show them a, something that's funny, show them something that's dramatic, show them something that's luxury mm -hmm. and get, get a response from the type of person you're trying to move that has a similar lesson you're trying to take away and maybe get to feedback on the territories and their response overall to that mm -hmm. so that you have a strategy now that's a calm strategy that can be informed by listen, comedy engaged them. It was more memorable, uh, but then they ultimately didn't change their behavior. And this luxury one, they hated the entire time, but then they mm -hmm. stopped They stopped looking at their phone, you mm -hmm. know, or whatever. I wonder if that's a better approach, but I've never had the wherewithal to pull it off. Uh, yeah, and I think part of that sounds like it's where teams decide to place their attention. We just had this conversation with a client yesterday, in fact, about how to help people internally at their company better believe in, I won't say understand because everybody knows it, but better believe in platforms other than the typical digital platforms they've been on. So yeah. the knee jerk reaction internally is to say, here's where our comms plan, here's where our media spend, here's where we're going to make the creative live. And Facebook is very different than TikTok and TikTok's very different than Twitter. So I'm fascinated by platforms and their promise, but I'm also because of the kind of work I do outside in the artistic and experiential realm, I'm, I'm very interested in being honest with what works for audiences in the exact platform you're building it, right? So 
if we make a movie, it's fundamentally a different artistic object than a even a TV series. And yeah. that TV series is fundamentally different than an experiential project. And we had a, an example I'd love to use is when we did a project at Tribeca called Where There's Smoke that was a, tough to get into in, in, in a short ter- time, but it, it, you know, it used essences of an escape room and digital uh, and uh, a gallery event. And it was all wrapped around memory and loss and grief. And yeah. a, a well-known director who's done big, big movies came out of it, a friend. And he was excited and we went and grabbed coffee. And I loved to see his enthusiasm. And he loved the experience. And he, he literally said to me, oh man, I want, there's this project I'm working on that's a movie. And I just, I think I'm going to just make it be this instead. And it's not wrong. Great. I love it. That'd be amazing. You're probably not going to get the audience that you would with the big movie you're making, but also you can't just take a movie and put that into a digital experience. They're very different things. So long-winded way of saying the comms plan and using some of this to help you identify not only what should be done overall, a kind of genre or approach, But also then understanding that that even if you picked humor and it's going to be digital, it's very different how that hits and how the creative should hit on the different platforms that you're going to put it on. hundred percent. Nick, this has been uh, really interesting. I I think we'll, we'll probably talk more about this offline, but um, really interesting to hear what you're, what you're working on, what you've been building and how, uh, how you're seeing it applied and the potential for it. Thank you so much for making time for me today. Thank you so much. I didn't even get to begin by saying how um, honored I am seriously to be in the company of you and all the people you've had. No, seriously, like Amy Keen and Zoe and even Keith Steckler. I'll say even Keith, who I knew years ago. (laughs) No, it's just, it's such a great group and such a great podcast. And thank you so much for having me. Um, My absolute pleasure to have you. And uh, I'm glad we were finally able to talk after going back and forth on Twitter for a long time together. Um, where, Where can people find you online? Um, let's do, let's do Twitter at Nick Childs. Let's yeah. do there. I'm very, I'm using Twitter as you probably know over the last 18 months, very specifically or trying to very optimistically. And the number one thing that it, that helps with that is meeting really cool people and trying to break the filter bubble of expected people that I might've followed before and trying to get away from binary conversations of it's this or that and open yeah. up the nuance. And that's, what's been a blast for me of meeting people like you and everybody else there. So find me on Twitter, jump into those DMS and I'll love to connect with anybody. Your, your, your energy of uh, thanking people for being for something good that they bring to your feed is is incredible. I, I love when you get on a spree of that. You'll do four or five of them at a time, and I'm like, Ooh, who's he, who's he thinking now? Yeah, Ooh, this would be interesting. It's just it creates good energy. So keep, yeah, you keep can just doing track that. that. You can you can use our dirt stuff and track that over time. And be like Nick's good days and Nick's bad days. Yeah, I'll bet that's true. <laughs> I'll bet that's true. I wonder does your do you see like uh, engagement spikes or like follower drops when people are like I don't want to hear any positivity from this jerk. I'm having a bad I day. I, I I'm not dumb, but I don't even track follower drops. I don't even know how to do it. I guess I could just look at whoever. I don't I don't pay attention to that, and I get no engagement. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> I get some, but I get people friendly reaching back to me. But yeah. I'm not kidding when it's no matter how many people I connect with or follow, I I feel like I'm screaming into the void most of the time. But also getting back to research and data and loving what that proves out is. I'm all over the place on Twitter. It's just like my range at work. And so I understand just like at work, I'm not going to get that next typical job. I'm going to make the path what I need to make it. It's the same thing on Twitter. I'm not focused. I'm not talking about one thing. I don't have an audience doing that. And so I understand that if I'm going to tweet half the time about Jiri Haji and 000 and TV shows and developing movies, and then part of the time optimism and part of the time about research, most people are just going to be confused. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have the same, the same challenge on Twitter. I, yep. I can't, can't remain focused there. And I, but your I, podcast is focused and also, awesome, So you got that going. I do pick some places where I really try to be focused. I have <laughs> a selective ADHD, I guess. I love that. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. It's yours. All right. Well, Nick, thank you again. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Strategy Inside Everything is produced by me, Adam Kierno. If you liked what you heard, please leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. It really helps. 
If someone shared this with you and you're just not sure where you could find it, you can go to specific.substack.com and sign up there to get episodes before everybody else. For more information about me, Adam Pierno, you can go to adampierno.com. There's information about my books, my speaking, and my strategy work. Have an idea for a guest? Send it my way. Just go to adampierno.com and you'll find a form there that will help you connect. Thanks for listening.